Welcome to this short film, Being a Journalist, Then and Now, made for you by UCL Special Collections and the Orwell Youth Prize. Together, we're going to explore the life and legacy of George Orwell's journalistic career and take a moment to ask some present-day writers about their experiences in journalism today. But first, who are we? UCL Special Collections is part of University College London's Library Services. We hold a collection of rare books, archives and manuscripts, including the UNESCO-registered George Orwell Archive, that students, staff and the public can access free of charge. We also run an outreach programme that inspires and supports learners to explore these collections in schools, community settings and on campus. The Orwell Youth Prize is an annual writing competition for young people in school years 8 to 13. Every year they set a theme inspired by the writings of George Orwell as a starting point to encourage entrants to think and write critically and creatively about the world around them and political and social justice issues today. It's free to enter, they welcome writing in all forms, including journalism, stories, poetry and essays and they offer personalised feedback to all entrants. Who was George Orwell? George Orwell was the son of a colonial administrator. He grew up in the British Empire at a time when Britain was falling out of love with its empire. This is uh, at the turn of the 20th century and you're starting to find in uh, popular culture figures like Colonel Blimp, the imperialist fool who believes that this is all a wonderful thing. Orwell came back to the UK where he was educated um, in private schools including Eton. Uh, his family were poor, he'd got into Eton on scholarship, he couldn't afford to go to university so he went back out and became a policeman in Burma. I think that was where the folly of pointless power was revealed to him and the idea of people clinging on to power for no good reason, the, the, the horror of being in the elite I guess. Um, and there's two br brilliant, beautiful essays he wrote about that which I think are crucial to understanding him and where he went as a writer. One is a hanging and one is a shooting an elephant. He came back to the UK wanting to be a writer and it took him a long time to make money as a writer. He uh, spent a lot of time as a teacher, he worked in a bookshop. All along the way he was writing, sometimes fiction, sometimes non-fiction. He was giving the advice to write what you know and he took that to mean write what you can know. So he went out into the world really. He uh, went to live in the East End in Doss Houses, he went to work as a, a low paid uh, dishwasher in a Paris hotel, he became a tramp for a while. He, went to understand what it was to live in the lower echelons of society financially, what those trials and tribulations were, and he wrote about them. So he'd started trying to be a writer in the 20s. It took him probably over 15, 20 years to actually make a living as a writer. The rest of the time he was doing other stuff. Straight away he ran into problems, censorship during wartime, and from there he coalesced his ideas, observing what the state does during wartime, remembering what it was like to be part of that state, spending all this time with people who were on the butt end of, of a system. And it all began to coalesce in these two, two of the greatest works of the 20th century, which is Animal Farm and 1984. They are uh, you know, science fiction, fantastical fiction. Uh, they're about power, they're about the Soviet Union, but they're really about the state, about the elite, and about the uh, people at the bottom and how they interact and what is done to people by power. And he wrote them with a beauty to them. He wrote them with the love at the heart of them. He wrote them uh, from an in enormously passionate place. They're the, probably the defining works, arguably the defining works of the 20th century. Certainly 1984 is still is still reportage. If you read 1984 right now, you will find it still happening in different forms. We think of it as being about Stalinism. It's not, it's about a state. Um, and very shortly after that, he, he, the hardships he experienced from living rough, catching diseases, getting shot, caught up with him and he died. And hard to know what we lost or whether he was just the producer of a perfect body of work. And that was, what he's left us. What's it like being a journalist today? My name is Stephen Armstrong, I'm a journalist. I mainly work in the fast growing dynamic world of newspapers, but the core of what I do is feature work. And the most interesting element of that is what you'd loosely call investigative. It's the longer form pieces 
um, or the book length pieces where you can really take your time to get into a subject, understand it properly uh, and find out things that have not been found out or have been hidden. My name is Mariana Spring, I'm the BBC's specialist disinformation and social media reporter and what that means is that I investigate the real world consequences of online disinformation, trolling, other harms on social media and I do that across the BBC. I do it for podcasts, BBC Sounds, Radio 4, um, for investigative programmes like Panorama that's on the television, uh, for the news bulletins, for news podcasts, a whole range of different programmes and also for the website and online and social media. So my name is Max Daly. I am the Global Drugs Editor at Vice World News. Um, so I'm a specialist journalist um, and I um, concentrate on drugs and crime. I won the Orwell Prize for some work I did on youth crime uh, and county lines. What were the greatest challenges that Orwell faced as a journalist in the 20th century? Orwell's challenges as a journalist were firstly the classic challenges that all journalists who want to do his kind of writing face, which is that very few people want to finance that kind of writing. I mean, it is very, <laughs> it took him a long time to get someone to buy his work, which involved him going into the East End of London and living in a DOS house. Really, you know, that. So he had to support himself. That was part of the thing. He had to support himself, he had to support his family. And he had to balance all those daily concerns with the writing that he wanted to do. It took him a long time to get to the point where he could be trusted by people, if you like. He also had this challenge, which is that he was of, to some degree, the establishment that he was criticising, which meant that he could find himself in positions of authority, such as he was overseeing certain forms of censorship at the BBC during the Second World War because he understood and he was of and his friends had been to Eton and they were now there. And that was problematic for him because he was an outsider and a rebel, but he was also able to be within. Now he had able to use that and channel that into great writing. But it's very easy if you're someone trying to do the kind of work he's doing to give up, to try and find a decent day job, to not go on annoying everybody, to go to the parties that they've invited you. It's just, that's all so easy. And he definitely, he, his great challenge was in choosing the hard route all the time. What challenges have you faced as a journalist today? For journalists, challenging times for citizens are good times for journalism. Uh, you tend to find that incompetent governments in a throes of collapse are incredibly leaky, that the fact that they're incompetent tends to mean that there are things going wrong all over the place and people who are furious about it. Finding stories is easier in times of crisis than it is in times of plenty. The hardest times to be an investigative reporter is when no one's interested because everything seems to be fine. The problem then comes who's going to help you report it because you do need to eat and how you're going to manage making sure that you can eat and cover the story. Initially, with a good piece of investigation, journalism, you're probably not going to do anything that will get you paid. You can't, there's very little money for that. One of the greatest challenges that I've faced doing the reporting I do um, is online harassment um, and being targeted with online hate and trolling. I investigate conspiracy movements. Um, I did that during the pandemic, uh, things like the growing anti-vax movement online and offline, um, but also other conspiracy movements around elections, um, around the war in Ukraine. And that means that I've found myself often targeted as a consequence. Um, people sending me horrible threats, death threats, really nasty messages, um, quite abusive language um, and unfortunately that's become a part of investigating these kinds of online movements. It's a tool that's used to try and get you to stop covering these topics, to get you to stop um, looking at and investigating the truth of what's really going on and the harm that's caused by mistruths um, and, and the impact that can have. Um, and actually it's a topic that in itself I've gone on to investigate, um, particularly online hate that targets women, but also that's often racist, homophobic, 
homophobic, um, offensive in, in a whole range of different ways. Um, and it's, it, it's quite worrying just how common that is um, and how many people, journalists and just your average person, are exposed to online hate and harm in that way. Um, but I personally find that one of the best ways of dealing with it is actually to go out and investigate it, to expose the problem and to look at the um, issue of what social media sites are doing, what government are doing, what policymakers are doing, and also what the police are doing, what law enforcement are doing. Um, and that's, I guess, uh, an approach I apply to a lot of the reporting I do. Um, another challenge of the kinds of investigations that I do um, is this issue of what's in the public interest, what's important to expose, and then also this issue of amplification, which we often talk about, whether we're actually giving undue prominence to something, um, whether we're um, giving it a bigger platform than it might have had if we hadn't have reported on it in the first place. Um, it reminds me of conversations that I've had with journalists who've never used social media before, but actually how the same principles apply, the same kind of uh, core values of investigative journalism, holding people to account, figuring out what's going on, exposing wrongdoing, they can be applied in the social media world. Um, it's just a new, uh, a new terrain that you're navigating. Um, it doesn't mean that the actual skills required to do the journalism are any different. One of the main challenges of doing my job um, is about authenticity so it's about sort of trying to dig down and dig around to get an authentic voice and an authentic picture of the landscape that I am describing um, so that is obviously very difficult because you know you, I mean you're not gonna sort of just walk up to a guy selling crack and heroin in the street and go all right fancy a chat I'm a journalist I'll buy you a cup of tea so it takes um, a little bit of time to sort of um, produce and create these sort of quality contacts. And that, that is uh, done through fairly sort of slow, sort of methodical expansion of contacts in that world. So you'll speak to someone who knows someone who knows someone else. So this kind of building a network of contacts. I think my main challenge is, is getting that authentic voice um, and never accepting that one person is enough you know, I would never do a story on the back of what one person said. You need to speak to a, a variety of people to help paint that picture. Um, and obviously when you start getting sort of three or four people saying the same sort of thing, you go, okay, well, you know, this is looking like I'm getting somewhere. How do you make a difficult topic or story relatable to your audience? For my reporting, I really try to humanise the impact that um, stuff happening on social media is having. I like to try and track down and find people who've been affected, victims of online disinformation or conspiracies to reveal what's been happening to them um, and to really understand and interrogate that. Um, I recently did a podcast called Death by Conspiracy and that was about the story of one man um, called Gary who had died of COVID and he thought COVID wasn't real. Why he got drawn into those conspiracies and what it meant to all the people who cared about him um, and who knew him. Um, and that one story was very much emblematic of a wider issue, the way that we've seen conspiracies and mistruths about COVID cause harm to people, people to actually fall ill and in the case of Gary, lose his life in a way that's linked to belief in that disinformation. And so I think by finding stories that really capture the attention of the audience and really being able to show how they affect real people, they're not just fringe, quirky internet phenomena, but things that can change people's lives and, 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 and ruin people's lives. I think it's vital when covering disinformation and conspiracies um, that you come at it from a point of empathy. Um, and I think that it's really vital to actually challenge the misconceptions that we all have about who really believes this stuff. The question you have to ask yourself as you're forming the idea of the story, and also when you're writing it, who it's impacting, because then if it's impacting a lot of people, then immediately people are relating to it. As we know with Orwell, you know, you know journalism and, and writing is, is an art. And so you have to sort of get across, there's no, no good getting across doing all your research and getting your story and then making it so sort of incomprehensible and dense or boring or whatever that everyone's going to switch off. So you, obviously to make it relatable, you have to speak in a, in a clear, clear voice. 
Um, and I you know I've always tried to get things across absolutely as directly as possible. That doesn't mean you have to kind of lose out on some description and some detail, because obviously that's often quite interesting, but I think just getting whatever your, the main message is that you want to get across with this piece, being very clear about that so people can understand, okay, this is an interesting story, but also I'm shocked or surprised or interested about what is, how this is impacting people um, like me or people I'm, I know or people over there or whatever. What do you think Orwell's legacy is? A lot of the principles that Orwell uh, promoted, the idea of being able to talk about uncomfortable truths, being able to, um, uh, defending people's right to uh, say the truth and to disagree, um, I think are actually at the heart of a lot of the reporting I do. But what's quite interesting is a lot of the online conspiracy movements have almost co-opted Orwell and said, right, actually, we, we are the people that defend freedom of speech and you, you are the people telling us that we can't say what we think. And actually, what my job is about is, is about pursuing the truth. It's about exposing the harm that lies can cause and revealing the importance of, of the truth, whether that's about the pandemic, whether that's about elections, whether that's about war. I think that it's really important that we all channel all well um, and that we all pursue truth and we all do that and that often comes at a cost and there are people who, who don't agree with you and it's really interesting because um, a lot of these um, conspiracy activists will say, you know, I defend freedom of speech but yet me saying, oh well this is a harmful mistruth, they're not happy with that, they don't want that to be said <laughs> and that sort of kind of sums it all up really because actually it should be about uh, journalists and reporters being able to investigate topics and hold people to account and not being subject to hate, abuse, harassment in the process of doing that. The thing about George Orwell is that he believed in people over power. Now he framed that in the language of his time in a particular form of loosely what you might call ideology. He would consider himself a socialist, although he disagreed with all socialists. He didn't fit, which makes him very easy to read from any perspective because whatever you believe you will find some part of Orwell chimes with your belief. As long as you in some way are interested in and care for what power does to people, Orwell's work will speak to you. Whether you come to that from the right, from the centre, from the left, there is something in Orwell which you will learn from and feel passionate about because he can write about these things with artistry and with poetry in a way that very few people can. Most people who write about these things get cross, or shouty, or technical, or detailed. He knew what he was talking about, but he could make it sing so that you felt inspired and beautiful after you'd read it. To find out more about Orwell's life and work in journalism, use our free online written resource that accompanies this film. You can also learn more about the Orwell Youth Prize including how to enter your own writing and about UCL special collections from their websites. Thank you.